What if the same miracle that made life easier also made the planet impossible to clean up? It did. And it began with a revolution you could hold in one hand. A cup, a bowl, a stocking, a toy, a dream made from carbon. Today, we're tracing how plastic went from wartime wonder to everyday habit, and how that habit became forever. Welcome to season one of Time Goes Cold War coverage in our series War to War, where we cover the events of the decade after World War II that brought men from the brink of destruction to the threshold of the stores. I am Anna Deinhardt. And I'm Astrid Deinhardt. Hello, darlings. Now, before plastic, we had nature. Wood, glass, silk, gutta perka. Then came chemists who wanted to imitate nature and possibly outdo it. In 1856, Alexander Perks made Perkasign, the first man-made plastic. In 1907, Belgian-American chemist Leo Bakeland created Bakelite, the first fully synthetic polymer. It was heat-resistant, moldable, and looked like polished wood. And also smelled like formaldehyde. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but it became the shell for telephones, radios, and early kitchenware. Then came the wars, and chemistry was drafted. Nylon for parachutes, plexiglass for aircrafts, polyethylene for radar cables. By 1945, the LA's had perfected large-scale polymer production. So the labs that once built radar domes now had to find something to do in peacetime. Exactly. And they found it in our kitchens. When the war ended, America's industrial might was unmatched. Chemical plants that had made plastic insulations now made toys, dishes, and packaging. The 1950s see a fivefold increase in global plastic output. New polymers, polypropylene, PVC, polystyrene are cheaper, lighter, and more colorful. So plastic doesn't just replace old materials, it replaces the idea that things should last. Advertisers call it progress. You know, throw it away and start fresh. A phrase that will age very poorly. Meanwhile, across a shattered world, plastics help, of course, rebuild. Europe, East Asia and Japan still have bomb craters to fill and pipes to lay. Right, in Germany and the Netherlands, PVC and polyethylene become the backbone of reconstruction because it's light, cheap and corrosion-proof. West Germany's plastic production triples between 1953 and 1959. BASF and ICI scale up polymers that go into water pipes, insulation and the new lemonade kitchens of the Wirtschaftswunder. Um, and Japan? Japan's Ministry of International Trade and Industry, the MITI, makes petrochemicals a pillar of recovery. By the mid-1950s, polyethylene and PVC pour out of refineries around Osaka and Yokashi. So the same materials that rebuild bridges and cables also build countertops and toys. Exactly. Plastics become the infrastructure of optimism. Meet our fictional friend Evelyn Carter, young war widow, and now this George Riveter in the war industry, one of millions starting over. She buys her first nylon stockings. No more ration coupons. They shine, stretch, and promise a future that won't tear. She remarries, founds a family, and they move into a new shiny home in one of the many suburban sprawls springing across America. 
Now, a proud housewife and young mother, she embraces the bright new world. Soon, her countertop gleams with formica. Her cups are melamine, her radio casing, bakelite. What nylon did for legs, plastic does for life. Light, bright, washable and very modern. And behind every modern miracle, a chemical plant quietly hums. <laughs> In 1946, an inventor named Earl Tupper molds wartime polyethylene into a bowl with a clever airtight seal. Retailers don't understand it, so he finds somebody who does, and that is Brownie Wise. A saleswoman who turns storage into spectacle. Wise creates the Tupperware party. Women demonstrating, laughing, selling to friends. By 1951, the parties sweep suburbia. A little capitalism with your coffee. And it works. So, well, right, by 1954, Tupperware's revenue tops $25 million. Thousands of women earn money without leaving their home. Entrepreneurs inside their domestic sphere. Empowered, but also contained by plastic and by patriarchy. There you go. <laughs> Brownie Wise herself is ousted in 1958 by Tupper, the man whose name is on the lid. Which kind of proves the point. <laughs> by the mid-50s, plastics have entered every room. Synthetic textiles like nylon and polyester replace cotton and silk. Plastic packaging seals freshness. Children's toys become cheap and colorful and indestructible. Indifference to your feet, as we know from stepping on one barefoot. I remember, yes. Plastics are convenience solidified. And invisibility make them powerful. You don't notice you've traded wood and metal for chemistry until it's everywhere. By 1955, the average American uses over 40 kilograms of plastics a year. And Evelyn probably washes and reuses only some of it. Why would you? You just buy more, it's affordable and abundant. Right. Plastics promises liberation from drudgery. Not rust, no polishing, no termites. But they also lock women into the idea that perfection can be bought in pastel colors. Mm. Mm. Schwierig. Advertising sells control and hygiene, the spotless kitchen as moral victory. Which means if your house isn't spotless, you failed both your husband and modernity. Oh my God. The age of abundance has arrived, but so has disposability as a virtue. The US quickly exports its synthetic lifestyle. Europe's recovering industries copy America's models. Japan turns polymer into its own export boom. And Evelyn's daughter, in 1958, plays with a plastic doll made in Hong Kong while her little brother drinks from a cup that might outlast civilization. Outlast civilization? <laughs> from Livertown to Lagos, plastic becomes the look of modernity. Shiny, cheap, disposable, eternal. By the 1960s, scientists take note of plastic waste that doesn't go away. Fragments floating in oceans, clogged rivers, and burning toxic fumes in landfills. And that's before we even invent a shopping bag. Production source why recycling barely exists. Polyethylene films and styrene cups last for centuries. The same quality that made them miraculous make them monstrous. Permanence. In 1962, Rachel Carson's book Silent Spring launches the first environmental uproar. 
It doesn't mention plastic directly, but it cracks the myth of a harmless chemical age. And decades later, we're still catching up, counting the costs and microplastics and melancholy. Evelyn kept her Tupperware set. The color faded, but the seal still burps. She stands by the sink, watching a TV report about polluted beaches. It was supposed to make life easier, and it did. Maybe too easy to throw away. Her generation won the war and brought the future. Ours inherited the bill. But you can't blame Evelyn. She was promised a miracle. No one said it would never die. Since 1950, humanity has produced more than 10 billion tons of plastic. Over three quarters of it still exist somewhere. Buried, partly burned, or floating. We made a material that never goes away and then built a civilization on the idea of throwing it away. Plastic gave us cleanliness, comfort and color, but also a new kind of geology, the plasticine. We're still living in Evelyn's kitchen, just on a planet-sized countertop. Right. The first half of the plastic age was promise. The second half is reckoning. We made something to last forever. Now we have to learn what to do with it forever. It is only because of the Time Ghost Army that we here in Time Ghost are capable of shining light onto some of the most defining moments of history. To become part of the mission, head over to timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Excelsior!